Good, good morning, everyone. I want to wish each and every one of us a pleasant Sabbath morning. We are privileged again to bring to you the lesson, okay? And, and we have been studying the, this quarter lesson deals with the three cosmic messages, and we know that deal with Revelation 14, okay? We have dealt with Jesus 1. We know the end of the chapter. We know the end of the road is that Jesus won the battle, Okay? Then we have studied a moment in destiny, whereby you are, you, are, you are to make a decision that will determine your destiny. And then we, 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 we learn also of the everlasting gospel, the good news, what Jesus did for us. And this morning, we are studying the fear of the Lord, fear God, and give glory to him. Before we go any further, I want to introduce my panel with us. We have Sister Miller and Sister Matthew. Okay, before we go any further, let us all bow our heads as Sister Miller lead us out in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks today for your loving kindness towards us. And as we take the time to study your word, we pray that you will be with us even now. And that those who are listening will learn something so that they will be transformed to meet you when you shall come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. And Sabbath introduction talks about our memory verse. It says, here are the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. We realize there are two things that the patience of the saints will be doing. First of all, they'll be keeping God's commandments and they'll be having faith in Jesus. Okay, and what comes to mind as I, as I study this text, here are the patience of the saints. Paul says we are in a race. And yet this race, we have to run this race with patience. Getting rid of the besetting sin and looking unto Jesus or, or to finish our faith. The, the, the lesson talks about a, 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 a clown who, was, who had been part of a performance and a fire broke out. And he was shouting, fire, fire, get out of the building, fire. And everybody was clapping. They thought he was performing. They thought he was putting on a show when, he was, when it was supposed to be a fire. And they were supposed to be, you know, getting ready to get out of there. But they were clapping and they were happy. It's just an illustration. But it shows us that this is how the world is. Yeah. While we are preaching God's gospel, people live as the days of Noah. It doesn't care about the seriousness of salvation. When, when, when we know that one day God will come to take a prepared set of people with him. Okay, it says, the end of the world, the events leading up to it, are as, as, uh, as we know, is no joke. Okay, it's no joke. Okay, the world faces the most serious crisis since the flood. In fact, Peter himself says, Concerning the flood, let me hear. Having, well, he says, the heaven will pass away with a great noise, and the element will melt with fervent feet, with fervent heat. But the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Having been warned, what about his coming? We no, we now need to be prepared for it as well. Amen. What is Peter is saying here? Just as the days of Noah, while the people were living a carefree life. They didn't think they wasn't thinking about salvation. The flood came and all were destroyed. Today, this message is going out. The third angel message is a message of warning to God's people. Mm -hmm. a, a warning to come out and come to safety. Just as the people they were to find safety in the ark. Our safety today is in the arms of Jesus. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Sunday, Sunday section talks about. Fear God. God. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, when, we, when we read the, 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 mem the text, the text for, for Sunday, it says, the angels were crying out to the world to fear God, right? And give glory to him for the awe of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountain of water. When you look at the word fear, what comes to mind? <laughs> you know, Fear, when you, when, you, when you see the word fear, in most of the, in most of the context, it means to be afraid. afraid right. mm -hmm. 
to be afraid. But when you study the word of God, you realize in this context, it means to take God seriously. That is what it means. Abraham, we, we have a, 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 a scripture in Genesis 22. Genesis 22, 12, it says, And he said, Lay not thy hand upon thy lad, neither do, do thou anything unto him. For now I know that you fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. God spoke to Abraham and told Abraham, Go up on Mount Moriah and offer up his son. Abraham couldn't understand it, but yet he obeyed the voice of God. Amen. That is what it means to fear God. Fearing God means that sometimes we might not understand what God is saying. We must trust him even though we don't understand. Yes. The Bible says in Psalms 80, 89, 7, God is great to be feared in the assembly of the saints mm -hmm. and, and to be had in reverence and all them that are about him. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 2, 5 says, Then shall thou understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. You know, when I think about that, the fear of God, when we come into God's sanctuary, every Sabbath, every time we have service, we must realize that we come in the presence of God. How do we conduct ourselves when we are in the presence of God? Being in the presence of God, it means that we ought to show God reverence. Right. Fearing God means we're supposed to show God respect. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be in awe. We're supposed to be as Christ in humility when we come in the presence of God. Okay? You see, Solomon says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret things, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So we say a fearing God means taking God seriously, obeying him, when we're having a desire to please God continually. Mm -hmm. Right? Put God, fearing God means put God first in your life. Right. Put God first in everything. Let God make your decisions. It's the essence of the great controversy revolve around submission to God. Lucifer was self-centered. He refused to submit to any authority except his own, rather than submit to the one upon the throne. Lucifer desired to rule from the throne. Put simply, to fear God is to put him first in our, put him, to put, to fear God is to put, him first. to place him first in our thinking. It is to renounce our self-centeredness and pride and to live a life worthy to him. Amen. Okay, we see the contrast here. Between Satan and Jesus. Yes. Jesus was humble. Mm -hmm. He was in humility before God. While on earth, he, he, he obeyed the will of his father. Right. He was God-centered. Satan, on the other hand, was self-centered. In Isaiah 14, he says, hear what Satan says. He says, for thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend unto the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between Satan mm -hmm. and God and, yes. and Jesus. Yes. It simply means, the f when, it means when the Bible says to fear God, it's to put God first in everything submit our lives to him and let him lead out in our lives. Amen. Okay? May God bless us. Amen. You know, another meaning for the fear of God or what it means to fear God is uh, found in some scriptures here under Tuesday's lesson. 
as you rightly said, sorry, on the Monday's lesson, as you rightly said, a lot of times when persons hear the term fear, um, they think about being afraid. But God doesn't wish for us to be afraid. He doesn't want us. There's no need to be afraid of God per se. True. Um, because he's loving and kind and, and compassionate and gracious and merciful. Amen. So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 2. It says that you may fear the Lord your God. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. That you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Psalm 119 verse 73 and 74 says, Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice because I have hoped in your word. And Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 says, 13 and 14, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And we just heard it being read um, a while ago as well. Um, the fear of God, it, uh, reading all of this, we realize that the fear of God in this sense means we are to give him respect. We are to, to show him respect because he is due that respect mm -hmm. and in showing our fear for God it will bring about a change in our actions it will bring about a change in how we live because we honor and respect him or because we fear him we will seek to what obey mm -hmm. and follow his commandments we're following um, the scripture and what they're saying because Amen. we fear God then it will show in our actions. And our actions come about as a result of us being obedient, obedient. to his laws. Right? Now, we, we, are, we hear a lot these days that because we no longer live under the law and we live under grace, then that means that the law no longer needs to be upheld. It is no longer important. Does the Bible really teach this? Um, grace does not free us from obeying the commands of God. The gospel sets us free from the law's condemnation and All not right. from our responsibility to obey it. I, and we're going to look at some other scriptures. Romans chapter 3 verse 31. And I'm, I'm reading from the, um, the, the New Testament. Right? In Romans chapter 3, verse 31. It says, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? <laughs> because this. By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. And then John 14, verse 21 says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Mm. Therefore, if Christ did not expect us to keep his laws, first of all, he himself and his, and, and his, um, his disciples would not have been keeping them. And also, he says, if we love him, simply put, keep his commandments. commandments. Amen. Now, because we fear God, because we fear God, we are going to be transformed and it brings about a change in our behavior. We don't keep the law because we are saved. We rather... Am I saying it right? No, I think I... <laughs> I'm not saying it right. I, I realize <laughs> we are not saved because we keep the law. We can't. We don't keep the law to be okay? saved. Okay. We are not saved because we keep the law. Keeping the Sabbath, obeying our parents, doing good and all of that. We saw it in, in um, the example of the rich young ruler. 
he thought that he was doing all well because he kept the laws. But in essence, he, 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 his possessions were more important than the love he had for God. Yeah, and today we are told, and we are told through scripture, that not because we are doing good and we are obeying the law of God means that we're going to see heaven. Rather, what we learn is that because we are saved and we love Jesus, then we are going to be obedient, obedient to him obedient. and keep That's his true. law. We are obedient by showing that we are keeping his laws because we love him. That's why he says, if you love me, keep my, keep command. my commandments. Amen. All right? So, again, grace does not free us from obeying the commands of God. The gospel sets us free from the law's condemnation. That's why he came to die. Not from our responsibility to obey it. Right? Let's go to Tuesday's lesson. Living a God-centered life. Living a God-centered life. Life. Let's jump to the scriptures that are there. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. We know it so well. It says what? Seek ye first, first the, the kingdom, kingdom of God, God and his righteousness. righteousness. And what will happen? All these All things, these things oh, will, be added, unto will be added unto you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are what? Above, Love. where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on earth. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before us before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God you know our how do we live a god centered life on this world that is so it starts off by saying in an age of consumerism, when secular values have made self the center, heaven's appeal is to turn from the tyranny of self-centeredness. You know, consumerism teaches that we get value and satisfaction by using and buying everything that we can. We get satisfaction from the gadgets we get satisfaction from the movies. We get satisfaction from everything. The, the, the cars, the, the rich, the, 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 the mansions, and the amount of money that we have. That's what consumerism teaches. But as Christians, we believe that all of this is vanity. And one day, as we looked in the previous quarter, everything is going to vanish. And so living a God-centered life requires us to seek God first. And to think on things above. Because everything here on earth is nothing but vanity. And eventually, if we allow these things to have control of us and our lives, we will be perished along with them. Think about how easy in one sense it is to control your thoughts. At least when you are conscious that you need to control them. Yes. True. Often the problem is that unless we make a conscious effort to dwell on the right things, the things above and not on the things of this earth, our minds, fallen and sinful as they are, will naturally tend toward the base things, the things of the world. That's what it is. It's a conscious effort. That has to be made. Amen. A conscious effort yeah. that has to be made. Set our minds on things above. Wow. Finally, Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. What should we set our minds on? It says, finally brethren, whatever is 
true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And I must coin, in, in thinking about these things, we have to be careful of what we listen to. Be careful of who we listen to. Be careful of what we look at. Be careful of what we eat. Be careful of what we do. Because all of this eventually affects the mind and how we think. And that is how we can live a God-centered life. Amen. 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 On Wednesday, Wednesday's lesson is entitled, Giving Glory to God. How can we give glory to God? Mm -hmm. As Sister Miller mentioned, we can give glory to God in the things that we eat, the way we dress, things that we watch. All of these are ways in which we can give glory to God. In Revelation 14, 7, Revelation 14, 7, turn to Revelation 14, verse 7. Mm -hmm. Saying with a loud voice, fear if God and give, give glory, glory to, to him, him, for the, the hour of his judgment, judgment is come, and, and worship him that made heaven and, and earth. And the sea and the fountains of waters. <laughs> wow. Worship. Worship. Mm -hmm. Now it says, give glory to God. Shows, shows it, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, often appears only in the text of divine judgment. Yes, sir. Now, the first angel's message And we know where that's coming from. It says to do what? Fear God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Fear. And as we mentioned before, fear is not you're being it, afraid. It's, yes. taking it's giving reverence to right. God. Yes, yeah, true. Okay? Now, according to the Apostle Paul, our bodies are what? Temples. We could do whatever we want to do with not them. Not at all. No, we can't. This is God's dwelling place, and we need to make sure that we take care of, take care of our body temples. And we take care of them by the way in which we dress again, we entertain ourselves, mm -hmm. or interactions with others. Now, we don't think that interacting with others is taking care of your body or anything or using your, your body as your sanctuary. But it is. That's also a part of taking, yes, giving glory to God. Now, we give glory to God as we reveal his character of love to the world through our commitment to, to doing his will. Amen. This is even more important in the light of earth's end time judgment. So we're not about being self-centered. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about serving Christ. And if we know God, we would want to do everything and anything that pleases him and him Amen. only. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not confirmed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God asks us to be transformed. He doesn't want us to be complacent about what's here. You know, you get all the riches here and then you're satisfied and feel as though you've arrived. No, it's not about all of that. He wants us to be transformed and it's, that transformation begins with the mind. And with our mind, it controls what we do. Right. Okay? Your body, your mind, your emotions, all of these things are of who, who we are as a person. Now, the Phillips translation of the Bible translates the expression reasonable service as an act of intelligent worship. Mm -hmm. 
In other words, when you make a total commitment to fear God and glorify Him in all you do, giving your mind, body, and emotions to Him, this is an act of intelligent worship. worship. Amen. I love that. And two, in light of God's judgment, taking heed to obey, indeed, is a good idea. Amen. What more can we say? Obedience, transformation, a wonderful life with Christ. Yes. So we now go to Thursday's lesson, because we've already talked about giving glory to God, and we know how we give glory. We give glory by... Transforming our mind. In our transformation, it's an outward transformation as well. It begins in and you see it out. You see it in the way you dress, the, your interactions with others, the way you eat, the things you eat, when you eat. And that's important as well. Okay? In Thursday's lesson, it talks about the revelations overcomers. Revelations overcomers. Now, it makes a distinction between faith in Jesus and faith of Jesus. Hmm, what is that? It says faith is a gift given to each believer. When we exercise faith that the Holy Spirit puts in our hearts, the faith grows. We overcome not by our willpower, but by the power of the living Christ working through us. We, are over, we overcome not because of who we are, but because of who he is, who Amen. God is. Amen. Okay? We can overcome because you. he overcame. Yes. He was tempted, but he didn't sin. We can be victorious because he was victorious. We can triumph over temptation because he triumphed over temptation. So everything that we're going through here in life, we can overcome all of that through Christ. Amen. Amen. The question asks, what is the, me what is the means of overcoming and living lives that fear God and give Him glory? Let me repeat that question. What is the means of overcoming and living lives that fear God and give Him glory? It says, Jesus, the divine Son of God, has overcome the wiles of the devil. He faced temptation, thrusting in the promises of God, surrendering his will to the Father's will, and depending on the Father's power. Trusting him, looking to him, believing in him, we too can be victorious. Amen. Don't you want to be victorious? Amen. I want to be victorious. Yes. Revelation's message is one of victory, True. not defeat. And sometimes Amen. we hesitate to look at, you know, we don't want to look at Revelation because we yes. feel so scared yeah. and we're so timid. Yes. But Revelation, the book of Revelation, it's all about victory. Yeah. It's all about overcoming all of what he went through, we going through and will get through Amen. once we remain focused on him. Yes. It said that the word overcome is in the book of Revelations. Eight, 11 times. Mm. 11 times. You can imagine. He didn't use it one time or two times. Oh, you can be overcome. You can overcome. We can overcome. No, it was there 11 times. It's there repeatedly mm. to remind us that we too are and can be overcomers. Yes. Amen. Um, as I sum up, I'd like to remind us. There's something here. I'd like to bring your attention to it. It says... To give glory to God means to give him honor and recognize recognition he deserves. Rightly so, for he created us. He redeems us. Daily, he sustains us. And he's coming again for us. So at the same time, there is any, there is any aspect of the world. Sorry. At any at at the same time, there's another aspect of the word doxia, which is uh, another word in Revelation 17, glory, 
And in another language, it says doxia, D-O-X-E. No, in the New Testament, doxia can signify brightness or glorious appearing. You know, sometimes when you see the morning light come out, you're looking at it, and it's so beautiful. But can you imagine? It's, you know, when the nighttime comes, you're waiting for the morning and that glorious sunlight to come out again. Mm -hmm. But when Jesus comes, it's going to be such a glorious appearance. Amen. And we will be overcomers because Amen. we'll be victorious in him. Amen. 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 I, I, I like one of the scriptures you read there, Sister Matthew. And on Wednesday, we talks about Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, therefore brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, that you present your, your body a living a sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Holy. You, you know, to be overcomers, what I gather there is that it's presenting ourselves as sacrifice daily yes. unto God. Overcoming means having a walk with Jesus day by day. Overcoming means asking, or asking God to crucify self mm -hmm. and let Christ reign in our life. Right. And the Bible says to the last day church, the Laodicean church, that is us, right? Mm -hmm. He who overcome, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Yes. And that's a promise for all of us. Once we live faithful, overcome as life, one day when Jesus comes, we'll be given the privilege to sit on his throne. Amen. Let's be faithful, saints of God. This message is for God's people to spread this message to the world, to fear God and give glory to him. Mm -hmm. Let us be part of that three angels' message. May heaven bless us as we continue living for God. Amen. Amen.